and my coworker is going to be monitoring those and we can get to those questions. This will be kind of free flow. So if you have questions while we're discussing a particular topic, um, I'll try to answer it then. Or if I know it's coming um, later in the presentation, I'll let you know that. So the program was created in 1990. Um, and we've awarded over 30 million in grant funds to date. Um, in 2016, the funding was uh, formula was changed. Um, it's per page fee collected by the Register of Deeds in every county. So all counties contribute. No county contributes more than $30,000 in um, a calendar year. Um, part of the statute mandates that funds be dispersed across Kansas, and half of those funds need to go to city, county, or um, local historical societies. Through the program, the Kansas Historical Society has the opportunity to help communities realize their preservation goals and increase interest in their historic resources. So here's some numbers. If you've um, applied for the program in the past or been an um, grantee, you know that our maximum award used to be 90000 This year, we've increased it to 100000 um, due to um, inflation. Some um, raw material costs have gone up, um, and we haven't raised the award amount in quite some time. The minimum um, grant request is 5000 and it's a reimbursement grant up to 80% of costs for most people. Um, recipients need to provide at least 20% match. It needs to be cash match. It cannot be donated or indirect or in-kind match. And you have to have demonstrated funds to cash flow the project by November 1st. And we'll go into this a little bit more later in the presentation. So if you're listed on either the state or national register individually or within the district, you are eligible to apply for this grant. Properties that are owned by the state or federal government are not eligible to apply. If you're unsure of the status of your property, you can feel free to give us a call or email us. Um, you can also look at our searchable database, um, KHRI, which you can find on our website. Um, applicants need to be the owner of the property or have owner consent if multiple people own the property. Um, or if it's a nonprofit, um, a church, um, local county governments, for profit corporations, those are all ownership types. Um, also, exceptions might be something like a cemetery, but you still need to make reasonable effort to locate the owners and get their permission before you apply for the grant. Um, and properties owned by boards, trusts, or commission should include documentation that a vote was taken approving ap applying for this grant program. Now, for-profit corporations is a 50-50 match, um, and they also need to include documentation that um, their property will be threatened if they don't receive grant funds, or that the rehab is not economically feasible without the grant assistance. So those for-profit corporations just need to do a little bit further explanation in the grant application. Um, the eligible activities listed here are just a snapshot. You can see the program information for more information. Um, it is a preservation grant program, so rehabilitation, restoration, preservation, and then some non-construction activities are eligible for this grant. Some examples might be um, upgrading mechanical systems or remodeling a bathroom. Um, restoration would be reconstructing a missing feature like a porch. Um, preservation would be maintaining the pro property as it exists. 
um, or in the case of an archaeological site, erosion control. All work needs to meet the Secretary of Interior standards because this is a preservation program. And while all these activities are eligible, some are more successful than others. In general, um, proposals to repair and preserve the exterior envelope are going to compete better than projects to simply update or an already stable and sound building. This is a very competitive grant. And so the committee really takes in the urgency of the project into their decisions. And also no work is to be um, started until the grants are awarded and the grant administrator has attended the workshop and the contract with us has been signed. Excuse me. <clears throat> so there are some ineligible activities, additions, interpretive displays, any equipment purchases, major reconstructions, um, acquisition of property. So purchase of the property is not an eligible expense. Relocation of structures without approval. So if that's a project you're thinking about, please contact us so we can discuss it. Um, the grant administration expenses are not an eligible expense. And then general maintenance. General maintenance is at the discretion of the grant review committee. So keep in mind that there are certain things that all property owners are expected to do towards maintaining their buildings. For example, I own a ranch house and I have wood siding. It requires painting on a regular basis. That is maintenance. That is not necessarily something by itself that the grant can pay for. Now, for instance, if you have a wood sided building that has water damage from improper guttering and you are having the roof done, you're having guttering done, you can include some of that um, wood siding repair and painting as part of the grant. Again, I have to stress, this is a reimbursement grant. We don't just hand over the funds when you're awarded. Grantees need to maintain cash flow and your contracts are with the contractors. They're not with us. So you have to pay those bills as they come due and then submit for reimbursement. Documentation of those payments is required when you request reimbursement. And we do process those as quickly as we can. But once they're submitted to the um, our payment system, it can take you know, up to 10 to 14 business days to process. So make sure you're thinking about that when you're submitting um, your reimbursement requests. So say you get awarded the grant, what happens? You will sign a project agreement, a contract with us. It defines the scope of work of what's gonna be done to your building, the proposed schedule, it has reimbursement criteria and other conditions of the grant award, which we will be going over some of that um, today. The grant administrator needs to attend a orientation where we go over all of the detailed um, aspects of the grant and also that monthly progress reports are submitted. No project can begin until all of these steps are completed. Generally, that means work is not going to start until at least summer of 2023. If this is an emergent concern, it may not be the program for you. We also have our tax credit program, which would be another incentive that you could look into if this is work you needed to complete before next summer at the earliest. The application due, is due November 1st of this year. You can see the program information for submission instructions. It's through a program called Submittable, which we will go through step-by-step um, step in this um, workshop. The awards are not announced until the February 2023 Historic Sites Board of Review meeting because our committee, review committee, is built out of 
members of the Historic Sites Board of Review. They announce it at that meeting. And between that time, we're, after awards are announced, we work on putting together those contracts, those project agreements that we were talking about, doing those orientations, getting project signs out to you, which you may have seen on some other historic properties within your community. They are accepted um, through 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time on November 1st. In order to do this, you're gonna have to um, create a submittable login account and then select apply to begin the application. The application is live on our website now. Um, so you'll be able to um, look through that. You can invite collaborators to the application. So for instance, maybe you're on a nonprofit board and you have one person who started the application and you just want a second opinion, you can invite them to collaborate and you can both um, work on the application. Or say you hire a grant administrator or a grant writer to write your application. You can both collaborate on that. And you can also save a draft and continue the work later if you need to pull more information. Um, on our website is the um, 2023 program information. Sorry, there was a lag in my screen. Um, it has the important background information and instructions for the program. Please read this information before filling out the application. We want to make sure you understand the program, what its limitations are and requirements are before you submit. <coughs> and you can find that at our website. Slide. So when you get into the application, the first three sections are just kind of the general information we need to know. What's the property name? We've got a link there to KHRI where you can um, look through um, you can type in your information and get your historic property name. If you're within a district, not every property will have a historic name. It may just be an address. Just put that there. Um, we need the name of the legal property owner. So if you're a nonprofit, but someone else owns the property, you need to put that name there. And it needs to match the deed, um, property record card, or information you submit for ownership um, further down in the application. And this is the legal owner as of November 1st. Then we need the address and um, of the property owner and email address. Make sure that the person listed as administrator knows they're going to be the point of contact and will be responsible for progress reports and other project specific correspondences. You can um, go to the next slide, Lauren. Um, select the category that best fits your um, applicant status. Um, and if you have questions, let us know, um, especially in that for-profit corporation where it's going to be 50%. Talk to us and we can figure out what's going to be the best suited um, selection for you. Slide. Um, the section E is information about the property. Are you listed individually? Are you within a district? Are you not on the National Register, but in the Kansas Register of places? Um, please mark that. And then if you're within a historic district, we want you to put the historic district name. And you can find that information again in KHRI, or you can call us and we can help you out. Um, this next question is just for our information. If you don't know, um, you don't have to say that, you know, select what you think you're gonna do. Um, this just will help us further down the line if you're funded. Um, 
Now, each uh, section does have a character limit, so make sure to keep your answers concise. Um, this first section is kind of your Sparks Notes version of your project. Keep it short, keep it sweet. What's the basics of your project? You're going to be repairing 12 wood windows on the east facade. Perfect. Um, um, next slide. Uh, these questions do require you to give a written account and justification of your project. Make sure your answers are clear and concise so that anyone unfamiliar with the project can understand its objectives. For example, I'm reviewing your application. I have never been to your building, so you want to talk to me about the project like I've never been there. Um, don't assume that the HTF Review Committee has um, understands the importance of your project convince them that you have planned and will be able to implement a successful project. They want to see projects come forward that will be successful. So you need to show that you have thought through everything, you've got your funds lined up to make it a successful project. And also, every property applying for the grant is listed on the Kansas or National Register. So just stating that is not going to be enough. You need to say what's specifically important about your property. Next slide. Section eight is asking about community benefit and support. Be sure to summarize how much support you have from the community and back it up with letters of support from at least five supporters. And this is in section O further on in the application. The state statute requires that applicants demonstrate the potential benefit to the community and the state, as well as community support for the project. Because all counties are contributing to this fund, they want to make sure that the funds um, are going to projects that have support from the community. Next slide. The state statute that created this grant requires that the grant committee consider the condition of the property, the urgency of the preservation work proposed as part of the criteria for selecting the awards. Often this urgency piece is the most critical to the grant committee. If it's not urgent, then why would they recommend funding it now? So you want to briefly describe how the property came into its current condition. For instance, say the building was condemned and you purchased it. You didn't cause the building to go into the state. So you want to talk about what you did have done so far, maybe. What are the current problems? Describe what's the most urgent. Say you want to, you bought a theater and you want to restore the stage, but there's a hole in the roof. You should address the hole in your roof before addressing the stage. So really think about those exterior envelope projects because those are going to be the most competitive and the most urgent to the property. Next slide. <clears throat> this question also has to do with urgency. Um, state your case as to why the current conditions are endangering the property. What might happen if you don't address the urgent priorities written in this section now? How will the grant help you with this endangerment? Um, and endangered could be development pressures. It could be erosion if it's, you know, um, the site around the building or an archeological site. Um, is it lack of maintenance by previous owners, deterioration, poor construction? Make sure you thoroughly explain this in the section. Next slide. Have you, um, the financial needs, have you utilized other grants? Are you looking into the tax credit incentive programs? Do you have personal savings? Um, what other previous repairs have you done? Say you've done 
this part of the building, but you don't have enough funds to complete this last section, that would be part of the financial need. Have you really looked into all the other funding sources? Um, is this a gap funding? Um, say the project isn't eligible for tax credits. Um, we funded a gazebo in Eldridge um, or Eskridge, Wabunsee County. It's not a building per IRS standards, so they weren't eligible for the tax credits, but they are eligible for the Heritage Trust Fund grant program, as well as grading around the property, many maybe some site features that aren't eligible for the tax credit. So make sure to explain this in your uh, financial needs section. Next slide. This is one of the most important sections of the grant, match requirements. Previously, we've only asked you to demonstrate the 20% match, but that's not always enough to cash flow the project. So in this section, you need to show that you have cash on hand to cash flow your project, pay the architects, the engineers, the consultants, the contractors, and then seek reimbursement from the Heritage Trust Fund grant. Keep in mind that some projects cannot be split up into smaller projects. For instance, a roof. It's really hard to break up a roof into smaller sections. It has been done before, but if you know you need a new roof, you need to make sure that you can demonstrate you have cash to um, pay for the roof and then seek our reimbursement. It may be necessary for the grantee to pay the bills for the whole project and then seek reimbursement once the work is complete. Next slide. Also, part of the state statute that created the program requires that the committee take into consideration the administrative ability of the applicant when considering grant awards. So who you select for your, or for your grant administrator is important. The grant administrator will need to attend an orientation session once the grants are announced, submit monthly progress reports during the grant period, and they're the point person for the contact for the SHPO. Also make sure that the person you select knows that they are being selected and that they want the job. Next slide. This is the one place in the application where you can use additional pages as attachments to explain. Um, for instance, if you have an estimate that you received, you can attach this and then verbally explain it in the description box. This section will form the basis of your grant or your grant agreement if you're funded. So make sure the information is accurate to the best of your ability. Itemize out your proposed budget and schedule. Describe your proposed scope of work in as much detail as you know at the moment. We understand that once someone gets into a project, say you are applying for a roof, they get into it, they take the roof off and realize, oh, we need to do some work on the underlayment. That's not information you have at this time. So you um, don't have to put that. That's why we ask that you include a contingency. Additional details will be needed before you go out to bid for a contractor. Next slide. Again, like I said, this is the only place of the application where you can include additional pages. Maybe you have drawings from an architect already. You can include those in your application if you feel like it will help um, explain the scope of work. The items need to be distinct portions of physical work that can be completed and then be sought for reimbursement. This schedule, like I said, is the draft basis for your project agreement if you're funded. <clears throat> and you may need more than 20% of the match. Consider the breakdown of your budget carefully. These are the line items of which your reimbursements will be based. And we will go through this um, more closely. Here's an example project schedule and budget. 
generally reimbursements will not be processed for um, amounts less than $5,000. That's just from our um, administration. Um, competitive bidding is required for any work over $5,000. So make sure you're thinking about that when you um, are getting estimates. You may get an estimate from a company. They aren't necessarily going to be your selected contractor. They could be, but you're going to have to go out to bid if awarded. HTF grantees are not required to accept the lowest bid when seeking contractors. Um, and described work must meet the Secretary of Interior standards, which is why we ask for you to submit your invitation to bid and your scope of work before they're posted if you're awarded a grant, because we want to make sure that you're not asking for something that's not going to be allowed by the grant, because this is a preservation grant program. Next slide. When you're seeking reimbursement, the work has to be 100% complete. This is a distinct portion, a line item. We're not saying that the whole project has to be complete, <coughs> but um, we can't reimburse for setup fees, mobilization costs, ripping off a roof, taking out windows, opening up a wall or ceiling. Those are not 100% complete items. For example, say we did reimburse for taking the roof off and then your contractor leaves. That means you have an unfinished roof that we've paid for. Um, we wanna pay for um, projects that are gonna be 100% complete when we reimburse them. And HDF can, HDF can only reimburse once that roof is reinstalled in this example, or that the windows are repaired and reinstalled. And in, as part of the reimbursement, we need to have photos that show that it meets the submitted contract that we've approved, meets the Secretary of Interior standards. <coughs> you have proof of payment, an invoice, and it's part of the grant agreement that it's not work that we haven't approved as part of the grant. Next slide. Now here's an example. Your project includes window rehab. We recommend breaking it up by the number of windows rather than by phases of window work because if you have them remove the 12 windows, that's $5,000. You rep They repair the windows offsite, that's $11,000. We can't reimburse you until that third step, which is re reinstall the 12 windows. So that means that you're out that total amount before we can reimburse you. But not all contractors are gonna be okay with this. So, um, but this is our recommended way is say you have six windows on the North facade, that's $10,000. We can reimburse that $10,000 and then you can move on to the next six windows on the South facade. Because remember, we can't pay for setup, demolition or mobilization costs. Next slide. But as part of the reimbursement, we do withhold a 10% retainage from each reimbursement. And this allows the grantee, um, or this allows us to make sure that the project is complete um, per the contract and that we get our grant signed back because we reuse those every year. Um, we also encourage you to um, withhold your own retainage from contractors. Five to 10% is common. And this allows you some assurances that the project is complete to your satisfaction. Next. So we aren't going to um, hold it against you that you are withholding your own retainage as part of reimbursements. So for instance, in that previous example, the contractor completes the west side windows and bills you for $10,000. You have a 10% retainage in your contract already that allows you to withhold 10%. So that means you're paying the contractor $9,000. But we will put back your retainage 
and do the reimbursement based off the $10,000 build. So HTF is going to reimburse 80% of that 10,000, which is 8,000. But remember, we also withhold a 10% retainage. So 10% of 8,000 is 800. So from that $10,000 invoice, we are reimbursing you 7,200. Next slide. Because we use this grant to match federal funds that support other programs administered by our office, this program also has to follow the same grant requirements as federal funding. That excuse me. That means that you have to seek competitive bids over five thousand dollars. In some instances, there is some non-competitive direct negotiated contracts that may be approved. For instance, we just had a project um, in Vinland, Douglas County, where they had pressed metal siding. They know that it came from um, WF Norman in Nevada, uh, Missouri. They're the only ones who have that press, so they went directly to them, and that was a case where it was approved. You may have a vitrolite storefront. There's only one guy in St. Louis that repairs those that's a case where it may be allowed. In general though, you should be ex expected to seek competitive bids. And this also helps you make sure you're getting a fair um, cost for the services you're seeking. Next slide. Ideally, grant applicants are gonna wait for the notice of their grant award and seek approval of their preliminary scope of work by us before putting a project out to bid. <clears throat> but it is acknowledged that some projects will be better served by upfront coordination with a consultant or contractor. Successful grant applicants must be able to demonstrate to us upon request that consultants or contractors hired prior to the grant awards were chosen through an open and fair competitive bidding process. Next slide. So here's um, a little bit more information on the consultants. So say you are needing an architect to develop plans and specifications for your project. They're assisting with the bidding process and they're gonna oversee construction. You can include those as part of your grant project, but um, if you're going to be working with someone that's over $5,000, it needs to go through a competitive process. And generally speaking, any project that's involving structural stabilization will recommend that you work with either an engineer or architect. Projects that involve simple repairs or replacement in kind generally don't require services of a contractor or a consultant, that is. But making an investment and hiring a good consultant does pay forward. Next slide. So this is part of a sample budget. Say you have masonry repairs that are going to total $36,528. You've got a roof that's going to cost $22,364. You've got windows and doors that are going to be $5,480. The total, the subtotal of the construction costs in red, see here is $64,372. But you also have work by a con or consultant, an architect that's gonna be 15,670. When you're figuring your contingency, which we recommend is 20% of the costs, you factor that from just the subtotal of the construction costs and then add in your consultant fees. So your total project is gonna be 9,000 or $93,916. And then you'll take 80% of that to get your grant request. Next slide. This is in section N. You wanna be sure to calculate the 20% from the con construction costs only. And I've created the form so that it automatically does it for you. <clears throat> and then you add in the architects or engineers fees if you're including those within um, your project and you want HTF to fund the project. 
keep in mind that the grant request cannot exceed 100,000, which means that your cost could be more than, you could be paying more than 20% match in the end. Letters of support, we talked about this during the community support section. You can provide from five to 10 letters of support. They need to be attached to the application and should be signed. Letters that are sent directly to us are not attached with the application. So do not have people send the letters to us directly. They should be sent to you and attached to your application. But keep the letters to a minimum. There's typically around 45 to 60 applications each year, and the committee reads the full application. So make sure to include letters of support that really support your project. Letters from Congress and politicians are sometimes effective, but letters from people with a personal connection to the property generally have more of an impact. We had a school in a rural part of Kansas have one of the students who visited write a handwritten letter. That really pulled at the um, heartstrings of the committee because it was really meaningful. Um, and then you'll also be required to include a preservation plan. This can be a simple one page, two page outline. If you don't have a preservation plan now, this may be the time to think about it, writing one up. Even a list of future wants and needs is a good place to start. If you need an example of a preservation plan, you can reach out to us and we can send you one. Next slide. No more than 20 uh, images are to be attached. You wanna choose the file name and label them carefully. Um, you can also include a page of um, labels for your photos, if that would be helpful. Um, and you can submit them as a Word doc, a PDF, JPEGs, and they can be historic photos if you'd like, especially in the case of reconstructing a feature or showing the level of deterioration. They should be in color otherwise and must show the architectural features clearly. The applicant is the sole responsible for clarity of the photos and photocopies. If awarded um, and you don't submit photos as JPEGs, we will ask for those um, upon award just for our records. So just be sure of the quality of your photos. Photos on your iPhone may not be as clear as photos taken with a camera. So just think about that. Next slide. You wanna make the first photo the pretty overall shot. We call this the three corner shot. Photos taken from the corner of the property allow the viewer to not only see the front facade, but also one side and a little bit of the environment. Next slide. It's also important to include some close up fo um, photos to show deterioration. You can, um, if you submit your photos as a Word doc or PDF, you could include circles or arrows to point out the items. Um, the grant committee is made up from the Historic Sites Board of Review, which has um, all kinds of fields. So they're not necessarily as trained as us to notice levels of deterioration. So pointing those out can be helpful. You could also call out the problems in the notes or file names or a small diagram of the building showing where the photo was taken could be helpful. Next slide. This property really went um, above and beyond and they used a drone to get some photos. Um, you may not have that, but maybe you could go to a taller building in your community to get, because um, this project was submitting for roof work um, and they wanted to show the deterioration of the roof, um, which are otherwise hard to reach otherwise. Next slide. You also want to make sure that you aren't including too much information. Um, grant reviewers are looking at lots of applications. Piling up multiple images onto one page may cause more confusion than clarity. 
So you really want to think through your project, keep them concise and show the level of deterioration that you are wanting funding for. Always be careful to show details with perspective and in relation to other objects. Showing a picture of a crack in the wall is not gonna be very helpful without the context. Step back and show the whole room and maybe point out the crack. Next slide. Um, you will also have to go to the website, print out the assurances page, sign it and upload. This is a requirement of the grant application and we will use this if you're funded. Um, number five, um, especially um, says that grantees are expected to pay all project costs and then seek reimbursement for a portion of them. Number six also is the HTF grant agreement will require owners to maintain ownership for five years following the completion of the grant. Also, owners must maintain the grant funded work during that five year period. So if you get a grant and you're reimbursed, if you sell it within the first year, you have to repay 100% costs. If you sell it in the fifth year, you're only paying 20% of the costs or repaying the grant 20%. And any work within the five years after your project is completed does get reviewed through our office. Okay. Um, we are here to help um, whether you receive a grant or not. Every building tells a story. You are competing with many others who have equally important projects. Tell your story, convince the reviewers why you should be funded and why your project is the best. Give your completed application to someone who knows nothing about your project. Does it make sense to them? Um, and again, we're happy to provide technical advice regardless of whether your property receives a grant or not. Um, good luck um, and we wish you well and we're here to help. Uh, next slide. Are there any questions that we've received so far, Lauren? Or um, you can feel free to raise your hand um, and we can unmute you and you can ask the question if you'd prefer. Um, I don't see any in the chat right now. Uh, Bethany, can you hear me? Yes. My name is uh, George M. Stevenson. I'm from the Leavenworth County Historical Society. Thank you for the presentation. I got two questions for you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Um, the You mentioned the match requirement must be able to fund the entire project. So what you're saying is that at the time of the final submission, we have to show a bank statement or some other documentation for the full cost of the project. Is that correct? Not necessarily. Um, we just want you to be able to remember when we were talking through the budget of those line items. Right. Say, for example, you are funded for a roof. You have some windows. You have some masonry work. Um, if you've broken down those projects into different line items, you need to show that you can at least pay for the roof first, and then the next reimbursement um, that you have funds to cover that. We want you to show that you can cash flow the project until reimbursements are sent. Um, I see. Lauren, I'm going to share my screen and okay. maybe... Uh, um should give you power now. Okay. Um, can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is our tracking sheet that we use. Um, so say you have a roof, you have masonry work, and you have windows. And for the sake of this, we're gonna do each one is $10,000.
So you complete your roof and you pay your contractor that they invoiced you for is $10,000. So you pay them that $10,000. So we're going to reimburse you that 80%, which is 8,000 8, minus the $800 retainage. So you're getting reimbursed only 7,200 for that $10,000. So that okay. reimbursement isn't going to be enough to pay your Mason who's $10,000. So you know that you have at least enough to cover your roof plus that um, amount that's come out. And the next one, you're gonna get reimbursed again, $7,200. And then your windows are $10,000. So, if you, you can also make sure that you're not leaving your big ticket items until the end. Maybe you have a bunch of small ones that are first, and then you're not going to have enough reimbursement to pay that bigger bill. But we withhold that retainage, so you're not going to get the 2400 until the project is complete, and we will send that with your last reimbursement or after completion paperwork has been submitted. Does anyone have questions about um, that? Um, George M. Stevenson, again, my second question is simple, and I'm sure you covered it at the beginning of their, your presentation, is uh, where do you set up this account so that we can, uh, uh, do we go to your site? set up an account and then get access to the application? I will um, show you. Um, okay, so if you go to our website under yep. preserve, grants, heritage trust fund. Yep. Here is the application. You're going to okay. click submit and it'll bring you to this landing page. Okay. And it has some information and it also has the application. Um, when you go to save, it will have you create an account. Okay. So you complete the application and then at least get started with it like the you know, the property name, the owners and all of that, and then you can save it, correct? Set up, yes. the account will be set up. And then as the, you gather the information, you can get access to this and complete the application. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you, actually I'm signed in. So let me log out and see what it does. You're gonna have to sign up first, actually. So you'll create an account. Okay. Um, and then the assurances page that I mentioned is found here. You'll have to print this out, sign it, and upload it to your application. Okay. Well, where do you, which, what I'm trying to get at is where do you set up this account? When you hit click here to submit. Yeah. Okay. It's going to, um, I was signed into my account. It'll have you set it up before you start the application. Okay, is where do you find that particular page? On our website, and you see here, click here to submit. When you click that, it's going to bring you over to the application. Okay, I think I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Lauren, this is Rhonda. And I do have a question. I hope you can answer it for me. We have a home. Um, an historical home on the National Register in Fort Scott. And probably our top priority is our front balcony, second floor balcony. Do I need to get bids from three different places for this application? Or do I get the bids? How, how do I know how much it's going to cost if I don't go ahead and do the bidding process before November 1st? Exactly. We do. You don't have to get three bids now. Okay. You can just ask for a quote. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, because we do expect that you're going to need that information um, 
to submit the application. But if you're wanting to do the competitive bidding process um, ahead of time, talk to us first and we can talk you through the steps. But typically, and especially right now in construction, contractors want you to sign a contract right now because costs are going to change because the raw materials are expensive right now and they aren't sure when they're going to get those in. So getting a quote now as a kind of estimate of your cost and then if you're awarded, we can go through the competitive bidding process would be our suggestion because we review um, all those materials. We Thanks, Lauren. That answered my question. Thank you. Um, I see a question in the chat um, asking about the project urgency. Um, so it needs to be something that's urgent, but not emergency. Um, so if you don't fix this now and your building's going to fall down, that's not a good project to fix. But if you have windows that are letting water in and you wait another season to fix them, that would be a good urgent project, but not something that has to be done immediately. That would be detrimental to your building. Did I answer your question? Taryn? If I didn't, you can unmute yourself and um, further explain. Uh, could you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, I didn't know I had enough good internet. I'm thinking in the example, maybe like a roof or a window, what happens if say, I mean, we live in Kansas, what happens if I have a tornado or a bad storm and the roof is now like urgently needing to be repaired, like an emergency before it wasn't an emergency in a sense. So if I were to be in the process of applying, you know, to fix my roof um, and then then say a tree branch falls through it and it's actively leaking. Um, do you have like to start over or are you even available to get the grant anymore at that point? Not Does necessarily. Um, say you get awarded for um, the grant, but before you're awarded, something happens. Mm -hmm. um, we would, you would let us know that, hey, we had to make these repairs now we would let the grant committee know that and they could potentially fund the project and then we would just refigure your scope of work to whatever is the next urgent matter um, potentially. But we wouldn't expect you not to do the work, especially if you have insurance funds coming through. If you have a hole in your roof and you want you're living in it, it's not a vacant building, we would want, you know, you should fix your roof. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if it would negate being able to be like awarded the rest of the um, the grant if you went ahead and did work prior. So I you think would that not, helped. you would not be reimbursed for the roof, though. OK, yeah, I think I understand now. OK. Are there any other questions? Lauren, can you pull back up that last page with contact information, please? If you do have questions, um, this is our contact information. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us and we um, can help you through the process. Um, November 1st is the deadline. Um, you can save drafts, you can um, have other collaborators help with the application, and then um, you will receive an email once you submit saying that we've received it. Um, if you don't, you can check in with us because then that means you, you should receive an automatic um, email from us. Well, if there are no um, other questions, Thank you all for attending the workshop. Um, this will get posted to the website if you'd like to um, watch it again as you're filling out the application. 
um, and we hope to hear from you guys soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Bethany. Lauren, you're awesome. You're welcome.